Okay, joining us now, a man who has been the executive director of the NFL Players Association since 2009. He went through one CBA negotiation in 2011. Another one on the cusp of a union vote. Voting is open. It lasts until next Thursday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern. The man is Demoris Smith. And, D, welcome back to the program. It's great to talk to you. Mike, uh, great to be here and always great to talk to you. Okay, so let's just get right into it. And... I've been paying attention to this process over the past year or so. For some people who really don't have any interest in labor negotiations, it came as a surprise a few weeks ago that everything seemed to be close to a point where the union had a proposal that it could officially consider and go through the executive committee and the board of player reps, and now we're at the point where there's a vote by the rank and file. Walk me through what kind of time, effort, and calendar consumption was ultimately devoted to the process where we now are? Yeah, well, Mike, great question. And, you know, I certainly understand that people, you know, might look up one day and just think that we airdropped into this. But this process dates back to even beyond um, last year. Uh, If you remember in 2017, I challenged our player membership to start getting ready uh, for a potential work stoppage. The, we knew that the deal ended in March of 2021, and we have been through one before. So really the process of thinking about um, the expiration of the current deal started in 2017. In 2019, at the last uh, player rep meeting, we had all of the teams represented. It was our largest Uh, player rep meeting of all time, and we had all of our guys go through three days of what are the most significant issues um, to the players, what do we want to focus on. Uh, One of the things uh, that came out of that meeting was a a clear decision to focus on core players, and those guys are the guys who make up the majority of the locker room. They probably are not superstars. They may play somewhere between three and six years, but there came out of that meeting in 2019 a list of uh, significant issues that we wanted to address in a new collective bargaining agreement, a theme around core players. And then what came out of that in April and May is a comprehensive proposal uh, created by the players that we sent to management. So, in April or May of last year, that was the, the culmination of a process not only to identify the issues that were important to players, but also to um, respond to the league's overture that they were interested in um, an early uh, collective bargaining agreement. And, and just so we're clear... The offer that the NFL ultimately approved, ratified, whatever, a couple of weeks ago, this wasn't the first time you've heard back from them. There continued to be negotiations and work and effort put into this from the time you made your first overture to them and the time we got to the point where the league said, we're ready to go, the CBA hinges now on the union's vote. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, We made uh, our proposal to the league, I want to say sometime in May, Um, We met with the league shortly after that. Um, It was probably somewhere around um, uh, August, uh, July, where the league uh, said that they were not interested in doing an early deal based on 16 games, uh, but they they would consider an early deal based on um, a 17-game season along with our other, you know, request uh, for improvements in the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, in fact, by the time that I started going on the road in um, uh, October, uh, it was clear from the league that they would only consider a deal um, in, a, in a 17-game proposal, and, and we actually made that uh, clear to all the teams, all 32 teams uh, that we visited in those six to seven weeks when – I was on the road. So, you know, to say that this is somehow of a, a abbreviated, short-term, um, instantaneous process, um, it has been a, a, a legion of meetings, discussions, conference calls, meetings with teams, meeting with uh, owners, staff-to-staff meetings that have literally gone on since um, um, uh, May of last year. 
So, D, what would you say in response to those who say now that the union's position in response to the league's essentially demand for 17 games, we're not doing 17 games, we're negotiating based on 16 games, we're not going to agree to 17 games, and if you don't like that, basically lock us out in 2021? Well, th- that, I mean, uh, that's a... That's a comfortable position, um, but you know my job as a union leader, my job as a as a CEO um, of um, uh, of the union, and and making an analysis about um, is this the right time to engage in negotiations? What are the potential economic upsides? Um, and I don't need to explain to you the the importance of the television contracts. But as a union leader, I'm constitutionally bound to negotiate in good faith, to um, um, rely on the information that came from the board in 2019, to discuss a proposal, to bring that back to our players, to have them discuss it. And ultimately, I don't get a vote on what the deal is, but I am constitutionally obligated to, to try to negotiate and, and put together the best package and then present that to our leadership to vote on, and that's exactly what we've done. But more specifically, why was a package put together based on 17 games? Why wasn't the position taken, we're never going to agree to a package based on 17 games? Well, the, the leadership never said um, that we would never play 17 games. In fact... The conference calls, the calls, the meetings were always around, okay, the league has rejected our 16-game early proposal. They have proposed a 17-game schedule um, early deal consideration. Should we continue to discuss with them the issues that would go into such a proposal if we played 17 games? And ultimately, if that's going to be the proposal on the table, that's the one that the um, leadership and, and, and now the full membership is going to vote on. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the concept of it being the right time as it relates to the TV contracts. There are people who believe that, that, that basically if there's a lot now, there will be as much or more later. How do you respond to that, that notion that basically it's just a bluff or it's, it's embellished or it's fake news or whatever the case may be, that the ball is on the tee or close to it now for the networks and that ball is only going to shrink and that pie is going to shrink if you wait a year or a year and a half or two years to do a new CBA? Yeah, I mean, Mike, you know, given where we are in the country, I'm not sure anybody's quite figured out how to deal with fake news. Um, but um, I do know um, uh, how to rely on... Um, data where we look at um, uh, not only TV consumption of the NFL, but what is happening with ratings um, in other sports and in other uh, television shows. The the reality is that the National Football League product, the game that's being shown on television, is still extremely popular. Um, It's also true that uh, while viewership has increased over the last um, one to two years, it's not at um, its all-time high. So, you know, part of our my job is is certainly as a union leader, but we I spend a lot of time relying on experts who are making forecasts not only about um, television revenue in the future but also um, the overall economic outlook for our business and making determinations about when is the best time or the optimal time for the league to do television contracts. And and lastly, um, factoring into that whether you are at a position of a net advantage negotiating with a work stoppage um, at your back or are you at a negotiating advantage at a time when we know that um, the NFL wants to strike the most lucrative um, television contracts in history? So I certainly understand that people might have a difference um, of opinion, and certainly everybody is entitled 
um, to their own opinion. I've said it before. I'm not sure anyone is entitled to their own facts. So my job, um, our job, is to analyze the facts that are before us. Um, I believe um, uh, unequivocally that the, 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 that for one of the rare times in history, the interest of the owners with respect to the TV contracts and the revenue that's going to come from those TV contracts is exactly aligned uh, with that of the players. Um, we constructed a collective bargaining proposal around those mutual incentives. And here's the reality. If, if the players um, make a decision that they don't want to do the deal, um, that's fine. Um, we go into the last season uh, this year. We'll probably be facing um, a, a work stoppage. And for those who think that that creates an advantage for the players, they might be right. Um, but all of the indicators um, that we are with right now, um, a deal that's on the table that increases our share um, by um, uh, 1% um, year over year and with the, the high potential of increasing it for another half percent, a 1.5% change on the table for us, as you know, given the revenue in, in football, um, is uh, probably the understatement of the year is that's significant. If you wanted to translate that into real dollars, it's um, anywhere between 2.5 and, and perhaps $5 billion moving from one side of the ledger, and that, that ledger being in the owner's pocket, to the player's pocket. And that's the deal that's on the table, as well as things that increase our um, uh, health care, increase our benefits, give us more control on our work schedule. Um, and I understand that it comes with a uh, 17th game, um, but that's the deal that's on the table. And um, I'm, I'm proud of the deal. I think that it substantially increases um, the benefits to core players. And it's something that I'm happy that um, the men in our locker room will get a chance to vote on. Okay, so for those out there who are paying attention to this, whether it's fans, media, <laughs> players who will be voting, whoever it is that is looking at this and saying, wait, how do we know? What are the facts? And, and I agree with your statement, and I remember it from the last time around. You're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your facts. What are the facts that you're relying on that support the idea that the pie is of a certain size now, that a year from now it will be smaller. So if you get an incrementally larger slice of the pie, you're ultimately getting less pie because the TV revenue pie will have shrunk. Um, I, I think I understand the question. Your, 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 your argument is that if, if you wait, the pie will shrink? Well, my, my question for you is, I mean, that's everything I've seen and heard and read leads me to believe that you've made the judgment. Now is the time to strike to oh. get the optimum slice of pie from sure. the biggest pie possible. And there's this sense that a year from now, the pie is not going to be as big. What do you say to those who say, ah, baloney, it'll be just as big, if not bigger, a year from now? Well, I, 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 again, I, I think that anyone who wants to say that they're entitled to their opinion, the, the facts that are incontrovertible, right, uh, are, are that uh, the TV contracts expire in 2022. Um, the, the league um, would love to renegotiate those contracts um, given the media landscape now. That presents them with the greatest leverage um, to do that is by walking in with um, a deal that has labor peace for the next 10 years. Um, but the flip side of it is also true. If we are negotiating at a point where we are facing a work stoppage, I, I'm not sure, um, and I'm, I, I don't really understand, you know, everything that everybody has said given, you know, their, their opposing opinion, but there isn't anything that prevents the league from going forward and getting TV contracts without a collective bargaining agreement. Um, I think that if they 
have to go and get those TV deals without long-term labor peace. It is common sense that those TV deals will be less than if they um, were negotiated with 10 years of, of labor peace. And if those contracts are indeed less, that's a smaller pie. And if the league has to take a smaller pie, why wouldn't they come back to the players next year and say, there is a smaller pie um, available, therefore you need, um, and we won't agree to, a larger slice of a smaller pie? You mentioned that the TV contracts run through 2022. The Monday Night Football deal, as I understand it, actually expires after 2021, which is going to be here before we know it. It is, and 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 I've had people, and and they raise it as kind of a a hunch, kind of an educated guess, just reading the tea leaves. Do you know whether or not the league is ready to move on one or more of these deals? That basically they've got one or more networks lined up, ready to make the investment, ready to commit to some gigantic checks, and they just want to get this deal done so they can close those TV deals. Well, I, I can't tell you well i can tell you the, the the league doesn't exactly invite me into those meetings um <laughs> i'm sure that comes as a shock to you um but um it also shouldn't come to a shock to anybody that i've met with all the networks over the last two years so um why don't i just leave it at that We talked earlier about the amount of time that's been put into this and the meetings and the negotiations, dating uh, dating all the way back to the the union meeting last March. Why do you think there's a perception now that the players haven't been part of this process? Well, you know, once again, I I think um, that that certainly people are entitled to their own opinion. Um, I know what the facts are. I, I know what that chronology is. I know um, uh, and, and participated in the meetings um, with the board in 2019, uh, with the conference calls over um, uh, the long conference calls over how to um, craft our opening proposal, um, the insistence um, uh, by some players to get outside consultants to advise us not only on the 2011 deal, but also what should be in the next deal. Um, the vote that we had on, on whether and when to send out that proposal, um, the meetings that we had with the owners, the meetings that we had with all 32 teams, the conference calls, um, the negotiations, Um, the two uh, player rep meetings, uh, mini rep meetings that we had in Miami uh, during the Super Bowl, and then again in Los Angeles after that, and then again in Indianapolis. Um, You know, Mike, uh, when I came to this job in 2009, one of the things that I committed uh, not only myself to but our staff to was ensuring – um, that this was going to be a players' union, and um, you know, I made the decision to to recommend adding former players to our executive committee. Um, it was um, I'm glad that the reps, you know, took my recommendation to increase the number of player representatives uh, per team to invite players, even who who weren't reps, to come to rep meeting. Um, I'm proud of our history of transparency and and um, and inclusion. And um, given those facts, I, I'm never going to um, give credence to to any uh, opinion that somehow um, people have been frozen out of this process. Social media was around in 2011, the last time we went through this, but it wasn't developed to the point where it now is, for better or for worse. What's been your perception on the role of social media, the comments from players, the back and forth? Does that help the process? Does it hurt the process? And how much do you follow up with players when you see that they're expressing their views on social media? Um, you know, I'll, I'll 
I never really talk about, you know, my personal conversations with players. So I'm going to, how about if I skip the last one? Um, you know, I think, you know, a person like you and, and, and maybe sometime after this, love to, you know, grab a beer with you. I, I, I think I would love to get your views on the question that, that you asked about the impact of social media. You know, I think um, whether we are looking at um, a campaign that's going on uh, or a Democratic primary that, that's going on right now and the effect of social media, look at the way um, uh, the coronavirus has been covered in social media. Um, does it have an impact on the process? Um, I, I think only a fool would say that it does not. Um, I think to a certain extent, the the advent of instant communication is, for the most part, a good thing. Um, I think that it gives people a voice. Um, at the same time, it gives people a voice. And um, I, I do think that going forward, this is a paradigm that we have now found ourselves in, whether it's, it's politics or, or um, the economy or health care or um, collective bargaining agreements. I think that there is a paradigm that we all now uh, find ourselves um, living in and, and in some respects grappling with. Uh, but here's what I, you know, my touchstone is this. Um, I, I'm constitutionally bound and I've got a fiduciary duty as a union leader to serve the interest um, of our players. Um, there is never going to be a night that I, I put my head down on my pillow where I haven't thought that I've done that. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, whether it's team visits or, or long telephone calls or being away from my family or, um, you know, spending time um, teaching, educating, um, it's not just me. We have a team of people who have dedicated uh, themselves to making sure that um, this is a union where our players are involved. And, and like I said, you know, people may not always agree, um, but, you know, the one thing we certainly have in this union, and, and I'm proud of it, um, are a group of people who are passionate uh, about their union, I'm certainly not afraid to express their opinion. I'm not sure anybody out there <laughs> is going to take a position that somehow um, we, we, we stifle um, a comment or communication um, or expressions of opinion in this union, um, that's fine. Um, I, I'll take that any day of the week um, than, than to be in a position where uh, we don't know um, where our players stand or we don't have um, the ability to communicate with them instantly. But when you see on social media, D, some opinions, negative opinions about the deal from high-profile players without a lot of detail, J.J. Watt, hard no, no explanation. Russell Wilson, very limited explanation. Other players express their views. Marquise Pouncey, amid the profanity, no, without a whole lot of explanation. Without getting into what you talk about with them, do you talk to them? Do you reach out to them to find out exactly what their, their basis for objecting to the CBA is? Um. You know, Mike, I, I, uh, I, I get your uh, um, desire to get me to talk about any conversation. No, 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 that, no, no, I don't know. No, no, I'm just saying I'm saying from from I'm, this is curiosity from my perspective, D. Right. When you see these tweets coming from guys who aren't involved in union leadership, they're not members of the board of player rep. They're not members of the executive committee. They've had no role in the negotiations and they do a drive by. No. I, I mean, what do you do? Do you talk to them? Do you try to find out what they're talking about? I'm, I don't want you to get into the conversations. I'm right. just curious whether you well, just you shrug can, at it like can, I do when people give me a hard time on Twitter or whether you – That, um, you know, that, that, that between the union, myself, our staff, um, we, we maintain contact with all of our players. And, and Mike, I would say whether a guy um, – is on the board of, of reps and some of these guys are, or, or whether they're a part of the executive committee and some of these guys are, or, or whether they've not been a part uh, of it, um, they're, they're more than entitled to express their thought and their opinion. And, and we certainly continue to maintain contact um, with them. I, I just draw a hard line 
because I do think that that while there is certainly a entertainment value to 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 finding out what my conversations might be with someone, um, I'm always going to respect um, the confidentiality of the conversations that I have with the players. But you can rest assured um, that. Um, there is always two-way communication, and I can certainly tell you from the players um, that I've talked to, um, I, I doubt that there's many players in the National Football League who don't have my cell phone. Um, they've certainly blown it up when they've wanted to, and, um, and that's a good thing. And, and I will take issue with your suggestion that there's entertainment value. I can show you the traffic to our CBA-related stories. There isn't a whole lot of entertainment being generated. But, but it is a curiosity for me because yeah. you've, got, yeah. you've, I mean, you, you know, you've got guys who are saying no, and uh, I, I'd be curious to know why they say no. And they're not telling us. Maybe they're telling you, but I respect it, that you choose to keep those conversations private. All right, let's spin this forward a little bit. If yep. the vote is no, Next week, when they do yep. the final tally, the independent auditor fails to get 50% plus one of those who vote, what happens next? Well, then um, we, we, you know, I, I hate to sound like a Patriots slogan, but it's on to the 2020 season. Um, you know, the, the, the league took two votes. Um, the league approved um, the 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 um, proposal that was on the table. They also took a second vote to say that they would go through the 2020 season and go through expiration. Um, the practical ramifications of that is that all of the um, uh, improvements to the collective bargaining agreement on salary, benefits, um, work schedule, uh, commissioner discipline, um, off season, all of those things that would go into the 2020 season would not go into the 2020 season. And, and that would include significant increases in the salary of the majority of our players. Um, uh, it would mean that the, the, the current deal um, is, is no longer on the table and we would go into the 2020 season if the league decided to negotiate, um, they would. The players would have to decide whether or not they wanted to make an overture to the, the owners to engage in collective bargaining. The, the owners could say that they want to do that. They could say that they don't want to do that. Um, but they took a vote to go through expiration, and, and I would assume that that's um, what they would do. And we would be facing either a negotiation in late uh, 2021 um, or a um, work stoppage, a strike, or a lockout in 2021. Or the league could, you know, as you know, and, and I'm sure you're, 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 uh, the people who are you know, following every second of this uh, know what imposition is. But, you know, uh, from a, a lawyer's standpoint, that – the league could also impose a system, and they could impose a system of, of how many games, uh, pay, salary, benefits, um, and they could impose that system, and, and it would probably be a system that's worse than the system that we're working under now, and they would basically dare the players to strike under that system. So, um, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, but uh, that, uh, the, those things are probably – the likely scenario in the event of a no vote. And I want to make sure folks understand this because they believe it's very binary once the contract expires. It's either a lockout or a strike. There is an opportunity by management, and this is a standard principle of labor law, to impose the last best offer before an impasse is reached at the bargaining table. And that last best offer could indeed be worse than the offer that's on the table today. We won't know until we get there. Oh, absolutely correct. And in the history of the National Football League, um, the players actually played under an imposed system, um, uh, you know, several decades ago. And, and, you know, if you remember the Plan B system, but that was an imposed system that was a restraint on trade. It was, it was not a good system for the players. Um, but that was an imposed system. And, and they imposed that system um, – you know, after, um, I'm sorry, before 
um, you know, strikes that were were not successful. But, you know, look, you know, Mike, um, in 2017, I told our guys to be ready for a work stoppage. Um, I told them that they needed to um, start saving their money. They needed to drastically reduce their debt. Uh, we had uh, a work stoppage manual sent out to every player and every agent um, several months ago. Um, it included ways to um, change their mortgage to a, a Union Plus mortgage, where if there was a work stoppage, there could be loan forgiveness. So the good news is um, – since the, the players uh, knew about the possibility of a work stoppage in 2017, and so did the, the agents, um, by the time we get to 2021, every player uh, should know whether they are prepared for a long-term work stoppage or not. Um, as it relates to the NFL, and this is something that I've been kicking around lately, as uh, as it relates to a work stoppage actually being something that can last. We saw the strike in 1987. It was three or four weeks before players started to cross the picket line and return after the replacement players were put in place. The lockout ended last time around just on the cusp of players actually losing real money and the ability to play. Why is it, in your estimation, D? that it's harder for NFL players to hold firm in a work stoppage, whether it's a lockout or a strike? Um, well, I, I, I'm not going to make any predictions about the future because I do think that one change um, is, A, um, uh, we started preparing for this in 2017. So my hope um, is that a work stoppage – with that many years of preparation, it would, would have a better outcome than than the work stoppages. Uh, I'm sorry, the strikes of the past. Um, but you know, when you look at work stoppages, you you, you don't have to just look at um, uh, football. Hockey went through a lockout, you know, almost on the cusp of um, the the lockout uh, by. The NFL in 2011, they went through their lockout, I think, 2004, 2005. Um, for a general question of, of um, why work stoppages have been tough in the sports context, um, I really don't have a good answer. Um, and, and I don't want to sound, you know, trite, but you, when you, you do have a, a group of athletes who are, uh, compensated at a higher rate than average Americans. Um, and, and they do have shorter careers, and that might factor into the willingness to sacrifice, um, you know, whether if, if it's, a, you know, in our case, if players are playing an average of three, three and a half years, a work stoppage of a year is one-third of, um, of the earnings. To, to put a number on it, it's probably six north of $6 billion in, in salary a year. Um, but the flip side of it is you do see successful strikes um, when it comes to teachers, uh, auto workers, um, dollar store employees. Um, and those are people who, for the most part, are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, so I, when I say that I, I don't know or, or understand, you know, I, I, I'm a student and I'm a, I'm a proud member of the labor movement. Um, strikes by ordinary working people throughout history um, are always tough, and they always um, envision a tremendous amount of sacrifice. And if you look at teachers um, and, and um, others, who have gone on strike in the last two or three years, you know, I think you'd agree with me. Um, it, it, it's mostly teachers and, and other low, um, you know, lower wage earners who are really bringing back the strength of the labor movement. Um, the reality is all of those people who are going on strikes are really putting at risk uh, the day-to-day -day living expenses um, for their families. So, you know, my hope that is that if um, that the players took the work stoppage um, advice from 2017 to heart, 
Um, my hope is that um, starting soon after 2017, that they have been working with their agents to reduce um, their debt and to certainly have um, a savings account with, you know, multiple zeros in it um, um, prepared for them heading into um, into next year. And if they've done that, then then we will be um, in a position of strength. Do you know whether they have? Do you keep track of that, or is it just something that's impossible to monitor? It's something that's impossible to monitor because, I, I look, I am always going to rely um, on the word of our players. Um, you know, last week ESPN, you know, completely butchered a, uh, a, a headline saying that I was confident that this deal would pass. Actually, what I said was that um, I remain confident um, in our players and in their families. Um, and that's never changed. So, you know, I'm not going to ask people to turn over bank accounts. Um, we certainly stay in touch with the agents. Um, and I had a good discussion with, um, the agent community, both in, um, um, Indianapolis and we met with the agents, um, during, uh, during Super Bowl. um, And, you know, certainly they are closer to the financial preparation of the players for a work stoppage. Um, That's why I believe having a good relationship with them is so important. Um, But um, other than relying on what I'm hearing from agents and the information that we have relentlessly provided to our players, um, we have to hope for the best. Historically, during your tenure as executive director, it seems like the relationship with agents has been not great. Why do you think there's been some acrimony, some mistrust, whatever the right words would be? It hasn't been harmonious at times. Why do you think that is? Uh, You know, Mike, I, I, um, I will certainly take the blame for, um, creating and having high expectations for, everyone in this business. And, and that goes not only to our men, um, um, where I challenge them to take leadership responsibilities, challenge them to make decisions on their own. I'm not going to spoon feed you answers. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Um, your job as a, a, a man, a businessman in the business of football is to understand um, exactly um, what what your role is and and to um, have accountability for it. If I'm going to take that position with our own players, um, I'm certainly going to take that position with um, financial advisors, agents, coaches, general managers, um, and owners of the National Football League. And I, I'm not sure that that, that means that um, I should be, you know, blamed for it, but I'm happy to take the blame for taking a position that where people have accountability, where people have responsibility, and where people have a financial duty, that it is the job of the union in those circumstances to hold those people accountable. And I get that I probably am not the most um, – um, I think I said it to someone else. I'm not a hugger. Uh, um, that's that's uh, the, the business. Um, whether you know the time that I was a, a prosecutor or the time that I was at, at the law firm, that's not the environment that I grew up in. Um, I, I've always been comfortable with people telling me exactly what's expected of me and and holding me accountable to it. And if that causes acrimony or um, a a lack of warm and fuzzy, I I get it. But um, I had, um, I I think, what I would, you know, characterize as a a, a great meeting with the agents um, in Indianapolis. Um, I I think that in the same way that you and I talked about social media um, as it affects, you know, politics or this process, I think social media has an impact on how people are viewed, um, and so be it. Um, But I'm never going to apologize for um, um, the role of this union in holding people accountable to a group of um, players who take pride in what they do. 
and, and literally rely on the advice that they're going to be getting from their agent and from their financial advisor. And I know not everybody has been happy with the rules and regulations that we've imposed um, or certainly um, the, the demands that we've put on continuing education or um, making sure that our, um, our, our, our membership understands fees and, and what fees are for and what they're not for. But, um, you know, Mike, you know, we, we uh, sometimes, you know, people have tough jobs, um, and they, um, the players who elected me, um, elected me to adhere to um, strict standards of, of what I am supposed to do, and um, I actually enjoy doing it, and uh, I don't go out of my way to rub people the wrong way. Okay, maybe I do sometimes. Uh, um, <laughs> well, that, we have that in common. Um, we have that in I, common. I, I have, right? I, uh, yeah. We have several things in common, but that's definitely one of them. I, I have a couple <laughs> specific questions about the actual nuts and bolts of the deal, but something you said earlier, and then you, you added some fuel to the fire by pointing out your past as a prosecutor and as a lawyer. It's, it's a true law nerd question for you. Oh, um, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. A hypothetical. Let's yep. say we get to the end of the contract the NFL imposes last best offer, new set of work, work rules like they did years ago, and the union does what it did years ago, disclaim interest, decertify, whatever the right word is, and therefore it, the NFL is no longer protected by the antitrust exemption that comes from the union relationship, and the players, while working and getting paid pursuant to the imposed rules by ownership decide to sue the NFL for every possible antitrust violation from salary cap to franchise tag to the draft, everything that would be a restraint of trade exacerbated by the American Needle case from a decade ago. Why not just do that? That seems like that would be the ultimate way to squeeze the league because you could have your cake and eat it too. Your guys keep working, they keep getting paid, and you can challenge everything they do collectively as an antitrust violation. Right, and and believe me, um, you know, as a as a, a nerdy lawyer and uh, someone who who prides himself on on game strategy, um, that is certainly a a game option. Um, the only thing that that I would say is, you know, every game, and I don't mean this in a in a trite sense, but but every scenario, let's say, um, while uh, feasible. Um, has downsides, right? The the first downside of a um, living under an imposed system is let's just we could pr- you and I could probably agree that the imposed system is not going to be forty seven or forty seven and a half percent of revenue, right? I mean, I would, I would, I would agree with that. If we consider right. the deals get delayed with TV by a year, yeah, I mean, they can right. make whatever number they want at that point. C- correct. So um, they could, they would probably, certainly decide to pay us less. That's number one. Um, there would probably be the elimination of benefits. That would be two. Um, it, it might be a 16 game schedule. It might be a 17 game schedule. That's that's fine. Um, but there could be an 18 be, game schedule could be an 18 there, game there schedule. Be, there could be, um, but there, there certainly would be a scenario where it would be less than the economic package and the benefits package and the work rules package that is on the table now. So that's number one. Number two, um, while, you know, you and I, you know, w- would certainly love the opportunity to get back into a courtroom <laughs> we would always advise our clients that that antitrust lawsuit would begin on day one, and that lawsuit would probably not see um, um, would probably not make its way before a jury for at least two years, and that even after you started that lawsuit after two years, that you would have to win it. And and I think you know I'm not saying. I'm not expressing confidence in my ability as a lawyer, at least not right now. Um, but given the restraint on trades and the the state of the law, there is a high likelihood that that we would prevail simply because the law is on our side. But you and I would have to advise our client about what the appellate process, right? Which yep. probably adds at least 
conservatively, um, what would you say? A year or another two years? 18 months minimum. Minimum. So now we're at two years plus 18 months of an appeals process, and that is before you have earned, I'm sorry, that is before um, one single dollar has been paid to a player. So if you and I are at least conservative about the timing of that scenario, you are talking about a generation of players um, because it's a four-year time span, who will have played for less, probably played uh, for less benefits. Um, the first thing that if I were the league that I would certainly get rid of is the pension because almost no corporation in America has a defined benefit plan anymore. So the win after four years, the win would be that – um, there would be dollars paid to players who are no longer playing. Um, and it might result in, in um, renewed interest in, in collective bargaining. But I think what some people forget is even after that imposed system lawsuit, antitrust law, uh, remedies, appellate process, even the paying of damages, the next step – for the players and the owners would be what? Collective bargaining. Right? Right, right. So you uh, would ultimately end up starting a process that we just finished. And, yeah. and, and look, that might be a battle that we have to fight, and, and it might be the opinion of others that that's somehow better and, and they're welcome to it. But the fact is that that um, antitrust um, litigation strategy ends with the very same collective bargaining that we just went through. Okay, a couple of specific topics under the CBA, if you still have some more time. I've imposed on you for 45 minutes now, but I want to oh, blow fine. through these quickly if we can. All right, sure. marijuana policy. Revolutionary changes, no suspensions for positive tests under any of the substances of abuse, separate apart from PED, obviously. But for the street drugs, no more suspensions for positive tests. The limits raised for marijuana from 35 nanograms to 150. Why not just get rid of the marijuana testing altogether, given the extent to which these changes have been made? Yeah, and, and we proposed that. Um, the other thing you didn't mention was that the testing window, which I think now is, um, I think it is actually April 20th until. Yes, it um, is, 420. Coincidentally it, or it not? Is, it is 420. Um, I'm sure that's coincidence. But uh, the testing window that's now at, um, at April 20th um, through training camp, that testing window drops dramatically to simply two weeks. Um, we proposed eliminating it altogether. We ended up with a policy that includes all the things that you said and the narrowest testing window um, that, that, that we could have. That, that's where we ended up. And now under the new policy, you can only get that banishment for a minimum of one year if you fail to cooperate with testing or fail to comply with your clinical treatment procedure at least – I think it's four times, uh, maybe seven. No, it's seven times. It's four times before you're suspended. It's seven right. times before you get the banishment. What happens to the guys who were banished under the old policy, the Josh Gordons, Martavis Bryants? Do they immediately get reinstated, or do they have to go through the process like they would under the old CBA? Um, well, you're, you're talking about players who are no longer in the league? Guys who are serving suspensions under the former oh, yeah. CBA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if the well, new one's put in place and they were suspended because of positive tests and now there's no suspensions for positive tests, what happens right. to them? Right. We'll have to take a look at that issue. Um, but to your point, I, I just want to make sure that we were clear on um, the, the changes between um, um, suspensions and, and banishment. Um, what we tried to do with the policy was to narrow the, the testing window um, to a as small as possible, which means necessarily that after that testing window ends, no one's testing for marijuana. 
if that what do you makes mean? sense. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you after mean? The testing, I'm sorry? Oh, you mean, yeah, after the testing window ends, no one's testing for marijuana, but, Correct. but if you're in the program, you're being tested for marijuana. And then oh. while you're in the program, the idea is to be far more therapeutic than punitive. So um, there's an assessment about whether or not there are any other issues, but after that, um, to your point, there we've we've virtually eliminated the um, the the uh, the punitive nature of marijuana. Um, the uh, the the 2006 contract uh, it had an opt out in it for both sides, and the NFL took advantage of that in 2008, setting the stage for the lockout in 2011. One question I've seen people raise: Why isn't there a provision in this deal? that extends roughly a decade to opt out for either side at some point, three years, five years, six years in. Yep. And, and look, one of the, the main lessons that I took coming into this job is um, it, it was to study the impact of the league having an opt out of the 2006 contract. Um, you, you hit the nail on its head. The, the league, negotiated and agreed to a contract in 2006. Um, they were happy with that contract for a grand total of, I think, 18 months um, when they opted out in 2008. They opted out primarily um, because they forecast and, and then went through uh, a huge economic downturn in 2008 and they utilized their opt-out provision. Remember, the players did not want to opt out in 2008. The owners utilized their opt-out provision in 2008 because they wanted to take advantage of the fact that there was an economic downturn. Um, they didn't like the way that they were stuck um, on the debt service to their stadiums. And they opted out of a contract in 2008 to take money away from the players. So fast-forwarding to 2011, we signed a deal with no opt-out. Um, but you and I both know that there was a downturn in television ratings um, uh, nearly midway through that deal, right? I think 2016, 2017? Yes. Um, if you were the league in 2016, 2017... And you saw an I'm sorry. You saw a a which started to be a sharp decline in viewership of TV uh, of your game in 2016 and 2017. Would you have opted out of this contract in 2011? If I was their lawyer, I would have recommended they do that. Um, I believe that would have been a serious detriment to the players because. For the last 10 years, um, eight years, we have seen a salary cap that has grown by at least $10 million. In some cases, I'm sorry, 10, yeah, $10 million per club um, over the last eight years. If the owners could have opted out of that deal in 2016, that would have been a net detriment to the players, right? Um, right. The same thing is sort of the same analysis going forward. Um, and, and again, people can have their opinions about what's going to happen in the future. But if uh, to mirror the, the economics of the last deal, if we know conservatively that a one to one and a half point change means a shift of money from the owners to the players, um, in billions of dollars, um, do we make a judgment that that's in the best interest of players without an opt-out? Yes. Um, does it insulate the players against a potential downturn in television revenue? Yes. Did we change uh, the way in which we um, monitor and improve the amount of revenue coming um, into the business of football to ensure that players get their share? Yes. Were we able at a position right now to forecast the changes in the gambling laws and to create language that ensured 
that the majority of gambling-related revenue, both on football and in some cases non-football gambling, comes into the coffers of the players? Yes. Were we able to make sure that changes in intellectual property um, down the road um, where the law, you and I both know that the law on intellectual property for consumers isn't particularly good, um, the players have a much better intellectual property protection and data uh, preservation and ownership uh, protection than the average citizens do under the law. So anytime you're making a decision about whether the things you can write up are more likely to be better uh, over a longer period of time, um, as long as the other side can't opt out, um, that became the consensus of not only our inside lawyers, but our outside lawyers and the, um, and the myriad of consultants that we rely on to make sure that we're getting the answers, at least uh, uh, as we know, is as good as right as possible. So, and see um, that that's in a. I'm sorry, that was a long answer, but that's why. No, no, no. Um, we we chose no opt out. As you explained it, though, it dawned on me that this is the crux of the problem, D. On one hand, this needs to be a partnership between the NFL and the players, and it needs to feel like a partnership that has cooperation minimal fighting, everybody trying to help each other, the rising tide lifts all boats, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, it's a union arrangement where there is a certain amount of built-in, baked-in hostility. It has to be there because both sides are watching each other. And, 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 and I feel like we're at a point in the development of this industry where the pendulum may be swinging more toward this idea that it really is a partnership, which makes it a little more complicated for a union to work the way it's supposed to because you don't want to be fighting all the time with your partner. You want to be a good partner. Does that make any sense well, at all to you? Well, a, a little bit, but y you know um, you know me, and, and you certainly have known the history over the last 10 years. Um, I, I mean, we, we are a partnership, um, but you know the last 10 years of quote-unquote labor peace haven't been that peaceful. Um, <laughs> True. And, and, if, and if the time comes where we um, have to do our job to protect our players, and that means whether it's suing the National Football League uh, like, we've, <laughs> like we've done, um, suing them not only over the personal conduct policy, but suing them uh, over, over um, issues of, of revenue that we thought was coming our way. We've won most of those lawsuits. Um, am I happy about it? You know, sure. Am I thrilled that we had to fight over it? No. Um, none of that is going to change. Um, but to your point, and I think maybe this is what you were, were alluding to, does that mean that where we are right now was a rare moment in time, given the changing revenue, giving, given the change in the TV landscape, given what, what we are forecasting are the economic headwinds that, that we may be facing, and realizing um, that a tremendous amount of revenue is coming off of their plate onto our plate by a change in the percentages, is this one of those rare times in history where um, many of our interests are aligned? And the answer is yes. And, and, and that is why both sides um, um, work to get a deal done? A am I positive that there are some things that the owners um, um, wished that, that they haven't given up on? Sure. Did we get everything that we wanted? No. But um, given that alignment to um, recognize and, and reap the benefits of an early deal, it did provide our players with one thing that we can all agree on. Um, a democratic process where they get to vote on whether they're going to accept an early deal or not. And if they vote yes, that's great. Um, a lot of great things um, improve for players. If they vote no, that's the democracy. And we play next year and um, we, we proceed forth with whatever our fate is. And with all that said, you said earlier that you're proud of the deal. Do, do you make a recommendation to the rank and file as to whether or not they should accept it? 
Um, you know, what, I, I kind of view my role um, more as a, a teacher, and I lay out for our players as best I can um, explaining what's on the table, um, certainly explaining leverage and, and the importance of um, where we are right now and, and whether that provides us with leverage um, and, and an opportunity with, with management. Um, it's also my job to teach them about leverage um, or, or the, 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 the absence of it or the presence of it. Um, if you're facing a work stoppage, um, you know, we have a few guys who went through the lockout, and I rely on them to talk about what it's like to go through a work stoppage. It's my job to teach them about the history of work stoppages, not only in our profession, but um, in other sports professions. Um, but Mike, you know, if you ask any player um, whether they've heard about the, the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire or the fact that teachers have been going on strikes or the fact that I walked two picket lines while we were in Miami and the importance of solidarity and the, willing, uh, the willingness to sacrifice uh, things for, for generations to come, they hear all of that. Um, do I, you know, ultimately tell them, you know, which way do I think it, it finally tips? Yes, but only after, um, I believe is my obligation to lay out and to teach facts. And, and after that, you know, people can, can disagree. And, and again, they can have their opinion. Um, but when it comes to the facts, that's really where I focus uh, my team meetings and 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 uh, individual conversations I have with players. Well, Dee, this has been very helpful to me. It's a full hour. I'm not going to impose on your time anymore. I know I'm taking the rest of the day off. You probably <laughs> will not be. Probably so, uh, will not be. Probably not. <laughs> good, good luck as this process continues, and appreciate your time in explaining this to our audience. Whoever may be in it, whoever may be interested, this was an opportunity to hear it straight from the guy who negotiated the deal along with the NFLPA Executive Committee. He's Executive Director De Demora Smith. And, Dee, we hope to talk to you again down the road. Again, Mike, thank you. Uh, always a pleasure. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.